Okay, uh, in the last video we outlined the evolutionary theory of rape. In this video we'll examine some of the problems for this, for this theory. So first of all, we saw that the evolutionary theory downplays the influence of culture. Um, it sees the ultimate cause of rape as being in our biology rather than in our upbringing. But now it, it turns out that rape is very highly dependent on culture. Uh, so Peggy Reeves Sanday, for instance, has found that in some societies, rape is virtually absent. In others, it's, it's very common. Um, so there's uh, this kind of heavy, heavy dependence on, um, on, on culture. There's a lot of variation, which we don't sort of see with, with other adaptations. I mean, like eyes and hearts and uh, opposable thumbs, you know, it doesn't matter where you're brought up you're going to have them. Um, but the, the, your rape simply isn't a human universal, um, or at least its, its uh, occurrence is highly variable. Uh, now, I, I do think there's a fairly simple response to this problem. Um, as we noted in the last video, uh, the evolutionary theory is not genetic determinism. Um, it's entirely to be expected that different environments will lead to different propensities to rape. The height of a plant is influenced by its genes, uh, but obviously environmental influ uh, conditions such as the amount of sunlight, nutrients and water will have an influence as well. So you know, that's, it's the same with, with human traits. Um, j just because something's determined by genes doesn't mean that culture can't influence it significantly. And especially with psychological traits, we should expect culture to have a lot of influence. Okay, so second and more seriously, we might worry about the cost benefits analysis um, that's assumed by the uh, adaptation theory. So in our evolutionary history, is it actually plausible that rape could have emerged as an adaptive strategy? I mean, there are several immediate problems. First of all, the chance of fertilization during rape is very low. Um, in general, the chance of sex causing pregnancy is low. If, if sex is forced, the chances are likely to be even lower, given the um, psychological and sometimes physical trauma. Second, even if the woman gets pregnant, would the child have survived? In hunter-gatherer societies, infanticide was very common. Um, the, the woman may simply have killed the child, just as these days many rape victims opt for abortion. And now even putting aside this problem, any child of rape that does survive would be severely disadvantaged if the mother ends up having to take care of it on her own. Rapists generally don't stick around to help with the upbringing. Um, being a single mother is fine these days, but in hunter-gatherer conditions it would, it would have caused a lot of strain. Um, the child may not have lived. Third, uh, this could have been a very dangerous strategy for the rapist. The victim might fight back or have a sexually transmitted disease the latter of which would be pretty devastating in a world before modern medicine. And if the rape is discovered, they might get ejected from the tribe, where it would be difficult to survive um, out there on your own. So there are a couple of um, points in response to concerns like these. First of all, notice that these problems apply to uh, sort of one-off rapes. But there's also marital rape and sex slaves and other long-term situations. In the case of marital rape, since rape might be happening a lot, the chance of pregnancy would be high, and if the husband is controlling the woman, he could probably prevent infanticide. Uh, and, of, and if you're raping your wife, um, unfortunately many societies have simply not cared about that, so you, you wouldn't be punished or ejected from the tribe. Even in the, in the United States, I think that marital rape was only made illegal in the 1970s. But second, and more importantly, Rape doesn't have to improve fitness very much in order for it to be selected for. Even the slightest improvement in reproductive success uh, will be seen, as it were, by natural selection. So long as there are circumstances where rape provides some chance of increasing one's offspring, then actually we should expect it to emerge as a reproductive strategy. Selection is is a very powerful force. It can see the tiniest advantages. That's how you get such uh, powerful mimicry in, in like butterflies and stuff. You know how some species of butterflies will mimic uh, poisonous species. Um, and, and the mimicry is, is often very strikingly fine-tuned. Okay, um, third, third problem. There are many kinds of rapes that simply don't seem to be amenable to an evolutionary explanation. Consider male-on-male -male rape, which is highly prevalent in prisons. There's also a great deal of rape uh, of uh, children and the elderly. 
Now, Thornhill and, uh, and Palmer are aware of this, but they point out that most victims are women of childbearing age, which supports their theory. So if we take, for instance, the feminist theory on which rape is motivated by power and it's a tool of the patriarchy, it's not entirely obvious why most rape victims would be fertile women. Thornhill and Palmer say, well, it's because uh, uh, rape is an adaptation. The psychological module that drives men um, to rape is, uh, is, is something that is designed to improve reproductive success, so it drives them to target primarily uh, fertile women. Now, it also uh, drives them to sort of target men, children, the elderly, but this is essentially a case of the psychological uh, module misfiring, um, which, can, which, which can happen. I think that we can kind of push this problem, though. I'm, I'm not sure this problem is solved so simply. So Jerry Coyne and Andrew Berry, in their critique of Thornhill and Palmer's book, point to a survey which showed that 29% of all rape victims in the US are under 11. But this age group comprises only 15% of the population. So under 11s are overrepresented among rape victims. In other words, it's, it's true but somewhat misleading to say that most rape victims are women of reproductive age. We have to look at more than just the absolute number of victims. Under 11s are not just occasionally targeted, they're targeted disproportionately often. And that clearly poses a bit of a difficulty for the evolutionary theory. Um, I mean, I guess we, we might suggest, well, maybe some of these victims developed early, maybe they looked older, maybe they had... Uh, secondary sex characteristics which made it seem like they might be able to bear children but surely that can't can't account for such a wide discrepancy i mean under 11 is is very young uh, the vast majority of under 11s are clearly children uh, they're not fertile not suitable for producing uh, offspring in the same way when we consider uh, prison rape you have to bear in mind that male prisoners are a very small percentage of the population so nobody would expect them to account for the majority of rape victims overall, but they they are disproportionately represented. I believe in the US it's something like 1 in 10 or 1 in 5 have been victims of some sort of sexual assault. Uh, I don't know the exact statistics, but it, it's a huge number, certainly in the United States. Um, similar difficulties arise when we look at the profile of offenders. Uh, we saw that that there are sort of three strategies for securing mates. There's honest advertisement of your skills and resources, deceptive advertisement and coercion. Now coercion is obviously the riskiest of these. Uh, it has the lowest payoff since it's generally only going to be done once, whereas honest and deceptive co uh, co uh, advertisement can secure you a mate for a long time. Uh, we, we should expect coercion to be a kind of last resort strategy. Men turn to it when they have no other options. Uh, so it would be disadvantaged men, men low on the social scale, who tend to be rapists. And I think that there is actually some evidence that most rapes are committed by the poor and disadvantaged. But it's obviously also very prevalent among high-status men who could easily acquire consensual sex. So the evolutionary hypothesis is that men have a psychological module which disposes them to rape in circumstances where this would be a good strategy for increasing one's offspring. And the trouble is that the data suggest that this module misfires very, very frequently. Uh, it seems to misfire more often than it works. Rape victims are uh, they're disproportionately people who have little or no chance of providing any offspring. Rape offenders are often men who have absolutely no need to rape. We would expect an adaptation to be a bit more fine-tuned than this. So consider that in the last video we looked at Cosmides' hypothesis of um, uh, the cheetah detection module. Uh, not, not in the last video, sorry. In the, in the first video on evolutionary psychology, we looked at Cosmides' hypothesis of the cheetah detection module. We saw the waste and selection task. Now what's striking about this is that when the waste and selection task is phrased in terms of a social rule, people get the answer right the vast majority of the time. The cheetah detection module is a plausible hypothesis because there's good evidence of a fine-tuned, highly refined capacity to detect cheetahs. But now rape is just, um, is just too messy. Uh, this is particularly odd given the very high costs of rape, uh, the immediate physical resistance of the victim, the dangers of retaliation and punishment. So, I mean, to be clear, the point is that, adap is that adap isn't that adaptations can't misfire. 
Um, so it seems, for instance, that we have a psychological adaptation for detecting faces, and that's why we're prone to seeing a face in clouds and mountains and pieces of toast. It's probably the most common form of pareidolia. The face detector module often misfires, but the point here is that there's no cost to its misfiring. I mean, it doesn't matter if we think that a mountain has a face. The trouble with the rape module is that it, it misfires in the wrong circumstances. Rape is risky. Selection should have furnished us with a rape module much more selective uh, than the one that we apparently have. Even cases which should provide the best support for the evolutionary theory end up looking questionable when we examine them closer. So consider war rape. This is uh, the most plausible case of rape as an adaptation. First of all, it's less likely to be dangerous for the rapist. The woman is going to be in a very vulnerable position. There's probably not going to be any danger of retaliation. Second, war rape often involves men who are not rich. They don't have a lot of resources. Soldiers are not among the most privileged of people. And third, in a, a violent situation, the man's life is under threat. So that would make it more urgent to spread the genes. Um, and we also know, we, we, we know, of course, that although war didn't occur in the Paleolithic past, there was surely a lot of raiding of neighbouring tribes. So it's easy to see how men might have evolved a mechanism that disposes them to rape in violent situations. So war rape is a, a sort of prima facie plausible case of th this evolutionary theory working. Now, the problem is that war rape is often extremely violent. Victims of war rape are... Uh, seriously abused in many other ways, which will drastically reduce their chances of bearing children. Again, if this is an adaptation, we'd expect it to dispose men to use only the amount of violence necessary to carry out the rape, but that's just not what we see. Similarly, um, consider partner rape. This might be useful evolutionarily, since um, it can be it can be it can be long term. Uh, it can go on a lot, which both increases the chance of impregnation and allows the man to make sure that the woman doesn't kill the child. But uh, Ethel Toback and Rachel Reed point to some interesting data on rape by partners. So considering women who were, who were raped by their boyfriends or husbands, one study found that of those women who became pregnant, 80% were physically assaulted during the pregnancy. Another study found that physical assaults increased after the pregnancy. Um, this makes very little sense in terms of evolution. If you physically assault a pregnant woman, you put her pregnancy in danger. So it's difficult to explain the behaviour of these um, abusive men in terms of reproductive fitness. So it seems like there are all sorts of different cases of rape that just aren't very plausible, uh, that just don't kind of fit the the evolutionary hypothesis. And we can certainly account for some of this by saying that the psychological module for rape misfires. I mean, we, we do have psychological adaptations, like the adaptation for detecting faces, and those do sometimes misfire. Um, the, 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 adapt, the psychological module for detecting faces misfires a lot. I mean, we very often detect faces where there are none. Um, but in those cases, it doesn't come at any cost. It just doesn't matter if we uh, if we detect faces where there are none. But with when you look at rapes, they often uh, rape is often very costly. Um, if you think, especially of people, for instance, sexually abusing their own children, uh, that's going to severely affect their reproductive fitness. Um, if you think of people raping the the elderly and raping children, if you think of male on male rape. Uh, in even cases which seem prima facie plausible on an evolutionary analysis, um, kind of don't fit when we look at them a bit more closely. So I think that this is uh, one of the more serious problems. A fourth concern is with the appeal to rape in animals. Does it really make sense to talk about animals raping each other? Uh, is it even conceptually possible for animals to consent or fail to consent to sex? Consent is quite a sophisticated idea. It's not obvious that uh, this is a capacity that animals have. And even if animals can consent or fail to consent to things, we might just be wrong about interpreting their behaviour as examples of rape. So when the male ducks gang up on the female duck, 
Is a female duck actually being raped? How could we know? I mean, we're not ducks. How do we know that it's rape and not some special kind of courtship ritual? The concern is that in appealing to rape another species, we're just anthropomorphizing them. We're not really in any, in any position to make a judgment about whether or not the sex among animals is consensual. Um, indeed, we might just be completely wrong about it. it. It could be that animals simply don't have the uh, capacities, the necessary capacities to consent or fail to consent to things. So talking about animal behaviour in terms of consent, force, co coercion and stuff is, um, is a bit dodgy. I mean, I think this is a pretty weak objection. I think it maybe works for the scorpion flies. Um, we saw that uh, Thornhill did some work on, on scorpion flies, which suggested that they rape. But uh, scorpion flies are just so different from us, and they're very um, simple, sort of the, the, cognitively, being insects. Uh, but with ducks and orangutans and other kinds of birds and mammals, I think we can have a pretty detailed understanding of their minds and behaviours. I mean, animals can clearly consent to things, at least in a broad sense. So our dogs, for instance, don't consent to being squirted with the hose after they get muddy when they've been out for a walk. They hate it, and it's obvious that they hate it. On the other hand, they obviously do consent to eating this tasty meat. Um, now there's certainly, I think, a legitimate worry about anthropomorphizing animals. What looks like rape might actually be something else. But the way we solve this is simply by studying them more closely. Uh, what's helpful, I think, with birds and mammals and maybe reptiles uh, is that you can sort of interact with them and develop a relationship with them. And that allows us to learn a lot about uh, their feelings, their perspectives. When researchers who've, who've studied ducks and who've closely interacted with ducks for years tell us that the female duck is being forced to have sex, I'm kind of inclined to take that at face value because... You can, you can almost, in a sense, develop a relationship with a duck, uh, just like you can with a dog. Um, you can connect with it, and that allows you to understand its mind um, in, a, in a kind of deeper way. So uh, I, I'm not convinced by, by this objection. Um, a related problem is that uh, rape is socially constructed. So this idea, the, the idea here is that what counts as rape is different in different societies. For instance, in societies with arranged marriages, consent is simply irrelevant. Neither women nor men choose to get married, nor do they choose to have sex with their spouses. The marriage and the sex are simply expected as duties of both. In this context, rape is a form of theft or property damage. Women are the property of men. Raping a man's wife or a man's daughter deprives him of his rights to his own property. This is a very different view of the nature of rape than what us enlightened Westerners have. So, so the point here is that talking about rape, given this fact, is, is literally nonsense. To say that something is an adaptation is to imply that it exists independently of social context. An eye is an eye, and the eye operates the same way no matter what society you're in. But this clearly isn't the case for rape. Talking about a rape adaptation is kind of like talking about an adaptation for legality or legal behaviour. Uh, I mean, obviously, legality uh, and legal behaviour, those concepts are just meaningless outside of particular societies and particular institutions. A very clear statement of this view is from Emily Martin. She says that rape, uh, and I quote, depends on the intentions and reactions of at least two complex social beings in some particular cultural context, it would be impossible to know from a description of the behaviour alone whether the act amounted to rape. Social context is always necessary, and of course this varies from society to society. I mean, I have to say, I, I think this objection is just a bit too postmodernist for me. Um, I think there's a reasonable point being made here in that it is true that rape is understood differently in different societies, and it's considered to have uh, different motivations and different kinds of consequences. But I think that the basic act of forced sex is not something that's sort of heavily dependent on social context. I mean, maybe maybe it is in borderline cases. So if you've ever seen Game of Thrones, that controversial scene where uh, Jamie kind of rapes Cersei, I can see the argument that whether or not that's rape depends on the social background. But something like the scene uh, from Irreversible with Monica Bellucci that's just obviously rape, no matter what society it happens in. So, um, 
but no, I, I don't buy uh, uh, buy this this objection. A sixth criticism is to challenge the theoretical background. We saw that the evolutionary theory rests on telling a certain kind of story about our ancestors. So uh, reproduction requires minimal effort from men, and men can in theory impregnate hundreds of women, whereas it's extremely uh, reproduction is extremely risky and costly for women, and women can only have a few children. So this leads to men becoming promiscuous and women becoming restrained and choosy. That's a plausible story, uh, but is it true? Well, we, one challenge to it is by looking at other primates. So the, the same points apply to primates, right? Reproduction requires minimal effort from males, um, but is risky for females. So that should, that should lead to the same kinds of selective pressures and the same kinds of psychological differences. Um, the classic study of Langer monkeys by Sarah Blaffer Hurdy, uh, I'm not so, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that name right, uh, raises some difficulties here. It turns out that female langurs are extremely promiscuous. Uh, the reason is that langurs live in groups headed by a single dominant male. Now, when a new dominant male takes over the group, which happens on average about once every two years, he kills all the infants unrelated to him. Um, one reason for this is that females aren't receptive to mating unless they're already nursing. So by killing all the infants, the male will be able to mate with more females. So you can see why the females are, un are under pressure to be monogamous, uh, to be promiscuous, right? The females mate with as many males as possible, because then if one of those males become dominant, he's not going to kill an infant that might be its own. So, so there's because of the way that that, um, that, that their uh, so that their bands are organised, these monkeys in these monkeys, females are pressured are under selective pressure to be promiscuous, uh, and it's not just. In these monkeys, there are many other examples. Here's a quote from Michael Kimmel. Michael Kimmel says, Primatologist Meredith Small reminds us that among some monkeys and apes, the female approaches the male, pushing her genitals in his face, slapping him, initiating sexual advances and clearly enjoying sexual games. Jane Goodall and Barbara Smuts showed that adult female chimpanzees mate successively with virtually every male in the group, while adult males are the ones who are sexually choosy, or at least try to be. Female baboons, too. Barbara Smuts comments that she has seen them literally hop from one guy to the next. They'll mate with ten different males in the space of an hour. And Franz Duval shows how among bonobos, there's lots of female, female genital rubbing, lots of masturbation, lots of egalitarian sex, initiated largely by the females. So, a great deal of empirical evidence suggests that th this picture of uh, promiscuous males and choosy females is just wrong. It turns out that sexual conflict, um, uh, or it turns out that the sort of different reproductive challenges facing males and females can be dealt with by a, a large variety of different strategies. It's not necessarily going to turn out that men are the promiscuous ones and women are the choosy ones. Um, and we can also consider human cultural variation. Uh, to sort of throw some doubt on this story. So Sarah Hurdy again points out that in many societies, female promiscuity could be used to convince many males that they have a role in producing the offspring, thus securing resources from them. Another quote from Michael Kimmel on this point. He says, Barry women in Venezuela engage in significant amounts of extramarital sex during pregnancy. When the child is born, the woman tells the midwife who her lovers were, and the midwife then goes to each man and says, congratulations, you have a child. The men are then expected to help care and provide for the child. This is just the kind of society Hurdy has in mind. In this social context, women would be selected to be promiscuous so that their children have lots of men pitching in resources. And the men would be selected to be monogamous to avoid depletion of their resources from many women. You know? um, so the point here is that the selective pressures that men and women are under isn't just a matter of their physical capacities for reproduction. It also depends on the kind of society in which they live. What kind of kinship system does the society have? What sorts of beliefs do they have about the relation between sex and pregnancy? I mean, we know that pregnancy is only caused by a single act of sex, but in other societies they might think that many, uh, uh, many men can contribute to a baby. 
Uh, what are their, their moral values relating to motherhood and fatherhood? By changing all of these cultural conditions, you change the reproductive challenges that men and women face, so you change the selective pressures acting on them. And I mean, this is, this is an obvious point, right? Selection is dependent on the environment. Now, the concern is that at no point in human history has there ever been a, a fixed environment, a fixed cultural context, context with respect to uh, reproduction and sex. Uh, in some places, there would have been pressure on men to be more promiscuous. In other places, there would have been pressure on women to be more promiscuous. I mean, we, we today, I, I think that the, the story that we have of promiscuous men and choosy women, it sounds plausible to us today, but then there is a worry that we're just sort of, you know, that this arises out of our own cultural values rather than it being a matter of empirical fact. Uh, for much of the history of Western society, uh, people had precisely the opposite view. People used to believe, if you go back to sort of the medieval period, the belief back then was that uh, was that women were the promiscuous ones. Women were the ones who uh, were just lustful and always trying to have sex, and uh, uh, men were more restrained and rational and less uh, less animalistic. Um, so you know. There's, there's a worry that, that this picture of promiscuous men and choosy women is more a reflection of our current cultural values than it is empirical fact. Okay, a final concern is, is rape behaviour a single trait? When we talk about an adaptation for rape, we're assuming that there's a single thing to be explained. But I think, well, we might think, look, it's just a mistake to have one theory. Rape is an extremely complex phenomenon. Date rape, prison rape, war rape, rape by family members, rape by strangers. Some rapes involve physical violence, others just involve threats, etc. These are all very different things, and we should expect that they might have very different causes. So the evolutionary theory is mistaken uh, in trying to account for rape by appealing to this sort of one ultimate cause uh, it, you know, of, of improving reproductive success in, in the past. Um, I mean, on the other hand, I'd also say that although there are powerful criticisms of the evolutionary theory, uh, this point suggests that it may well have a part to play. There are some kinds of rape that plausibly could have an evolutionary background, and that's worth investigating. Um, you know, I think it's we should just avoid dogmatism. Uh, you know, you you, uh, you don't want to start thinking that we can kind of account for all rape by a single a single theory but there may well be uh, a good role for the evolutionary theory to play. Um, also, we can also, uh, of course, criticise the evolutionary theory by criticising evolutionary psychology more generally. Um, if evolutionary psychology as a whole field is scientifically illegitimate, then obviously that throws some pretty serious doubt on the evolutionary theory of rape. I hope to look at some of those general criticisms in a, in a later video. Um, but for now, I think that's enough. I just wanted to give you a sense of, of evolutionary psychology in action, as it were, um, with a, a kind of detailed presentation of a particular application of, of the field. So that's that. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.